three, two, one. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Plotting for Success. Uh, we're coming at you with another couple guests, um, the guys from Plot Doctor. Um, those, those of you who are unfamiliar with the guys from Plot Doctor, they offer quite a few products, um, a couple that I really like using that at the end of the day, a lot of other people really aren't, aren't offering these products. And it's going to ramp up your food plot production and your germination. It's going to help your overall food plot health um, overall. So with that being said, I'm going to kick it over to Doug, and then we're going to get this thing rolling. All right. Well, thank you, Brett. Um, pleasure today to have on board all the guys from Plot Doctor. So Steve, uh, Kenton, and Andy, thank you very much for being on, on board here today. Um, to me, I try to explain to people it's not just the seed. It's how you do it and how you go about it. It's going to be about how do you feed your plants, how do you feed your dirt is uh, another great way of putting it. So um, what I like to do is uh, we're going to introduce uh, these fellows to you, and they're going to explain a little bit about their company. Um, they can explain how we met and how this all kind of came to fruition, so to speak. Um, so um, guys from Steve, uh, Steve, Andy, and Kenton, nice to have you on board. You guys like to introduce yourselves and kind of do a little bit of a background on what you guys are doing and how you are working on your new and the company that you kind of basically represent. Sure. Sure, I'm Steve Tatro, uh, the owner of TIP Inc. and uh, the Plot Doctor brand. We have an uh, agricultural business, potato handling equipment. We also manufacture equipment and we have a fertility company. And so uh, that's where the Plot Doctor facility came in. Uh, we've been around for 50 years now in Wisconsin, a family owned company. Uh, got a couple guys here with me, Andy and Kenton, they'll do their introductions, but they're, uh, they're actual agronomists. So uh, they, uh, they can answer the questions that, that I can. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy and Kenton. Yep, so I'm Andy. Uh, I'm an agronomist here at uh, TIP Agro Solutions and Law Doctor. Um, work with mainly any crop grown in the state of Wisconsin. We have a lot of outreach in a wider area here in the Midwest. Um, always been a, a big bull hunter my whole life growing up and I've been doing food plots for 16 years now. Um, so went through a lot of trial and error, a lot of different things, and um, kind of coming to a, a company like this and being a part of something like this uh, has kind of been a, a blessing in disguise. And um, I'll run it over to Kenton now and you can do his intro. And... Yeah, that was a good intro, Andy. <laughs> hey, good morning. Uh, thanks, Doug, and thanks, Brett. Appreciate you guys having us on. Um, my name is uh, Kenton Melberg, and uh, yeah, I work uh, with Andy and Steve, um, and uh, Andy and I are part of the Agro Solutions uh, division of, of TIP, which is our agronomy division, and uh, Plot Doctor kind of was a, a, a weekend offshoot of that to begin with. Uh, you know, we've always been food plotters, hunters, um, so we're professional agronomists on the weekday and then uh, we sub out our time doing our own stuff on the weekends and um, that's really the genesis of where some of our ideas and initial plot doctor thoughts came from was, was really just from trial and error on our own stuff and uh, trying to make that side of things easier um, and Doug you know you said you kind of want to talk about how we met you and <laughs> you know, everything kind of happened for a reason but uh, you know what some some sales guys stopping by on a on a weekday and you know, all right I'll I'll share the story because it actually is pretty funny it is funny it, it, you know um you know and I don't know if so, many of you guys that know me know where I live and I live in what my wife calls BFE but anyways we live on a farm in the middle of nowhere and uh, the I think it was Steve that initially called me and said hey would you be interested in talking with us about um, we got a new line product that I think that we really want to get into the uh, the deer uh, plotter type people. Um, we want to educate the public and it's a great product and it works exceptionally well. Well, you know, here I'm sitting here, you know, here we're going to have these guys stop in and here comes the dance monkey dance routine, right? So, you know, they pull up in a truck and four guys get out and I'm like, oh, now I'm bombarded. All right. So <laughs> sit down in my warehouse and you got four guys in front of me and they started spilling the beans. Now, you know, I'm an old school uh, farm guy. So when you start telling me liquid stuff, I get a little scared because I think it's just some snake oil stuff, all right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, all right, you know, I'll, I'll listen. And actually, um, ah, I forgot his name. 
uh, he Arizona. Uh, Eric. 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 Yeah. Eric said something to me that kind of hit me. Um, and it was what really was is about, you know, the, the cell type of your blood versus the cell type of Lyme and how quick it reacts. And I was like, okay, it's broken down so you get instant gratification. Because when I always grew up Lyme, in which you guys know this, you use Pell or, or Ag Lyme, it takes, you know, six months, eight months, a year to get a result on your basic Lyme that you're going to put out. So I'm thinking there is no way in hell that this is going to work instantaneous because that's just my mental thought process because of the old school farmer in me. So anyways, I listened to the spiel. Um, they left me some product and he said, just try it, you know. Um, well, here's what sold it. Just as simple as could be. I put it, you know, they told me how to mix it, which this is for you public people that are listening to this. Listen to the directions, okay? Uh, just read, I should say, the directions. Um, very important. Don't just dump it in a sprayer and poke and hope. Read the directions, okay? Now, which I actually did um, because Steve emphasized on that like several times before he left. Um, so that kind of told me to read the directions. Mix it the way they said in a bucket, put it in a, you know, in the sprayer, blah, 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 sprayed it. And of course, just like any sprayer, you're going to, you know, oopsie, miss a spot here and there. You can do that with weed killing or whatever. Well, where I missed, I could physically see the line from the sprayer, and it was almost 8 to 10 inches difference in length. And that was like, oh, my God, this shit works. Okay, um, so then from there, I started pitching it to customers and explaining it to customers, and I explained to them, make sure you mix it correctly, make sure, you know, because it's going to plug up your sprayer, and to this day, I still do not take out any screens or anything in my sprayer, which I'm just going to be up front with you. Um, I know a lot of guys do, and I know you guys kind of preach it because you're dealing with the public, okay, so you got to educate them, and I get all of that, but I found that if you do it correctly and you mix it correctly, it's going to work great. So I was floored and I got my customers that come that, I mean, you know, in which we talked about Brent on a show several times, they don't even know what a pH test is. No, exactly. uh, soil test, what's that? You know, mm -hmm. and they don't understand it, but thank you. You know, and we had Chris on here from Egg Source here, it was like a week ago. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 that's where it all starts. And I mean, you guys know this, um, that, you know, I'm sure that your potato farmers or whatever, you still need to know what your pH is at. And it, and, it, and kind of, otherwise you could be just throwing, and, and I'm sure you have farmers that do this, well, it needs it, so I'll put it on, or I think it needs it, so I'll put it on. So anyways, um, getting back to the main story here, I met them on a whim. Um, we came, I guess, highly recommended because we had good quality products and they wanted us to kind of share what we had going on. And honestly, I've been shipping lime to all over the place. It's been crazy. Um, people listen to the podcast that uh, Brent and I have done before. Um, I have talked about it last year on some guest podcasts that I, I, I was invited on and I explained it. And a lot of the people were like, you know, you're full of crap, which no different than what I was with you guys. You guys are full of crap. Um, but I learned that they, and they have learned that, wow, what, a, and the key is, is it's easy application. You're not, you don't look like Crasper to friendly gross when you're done. Okay. Any, anybody yeah, can figure it out. It's right. really simple. Yeah, kind of drove the whole, uh, the whole process of Plot Doctor, the whole conception of Plot Doctor was to make it convenient for the users. Because we're like anybody else, you, you, on a Thursday, okay, I'm going to go put my food pot in on Saturday. Well, you can't run to the feed mill and pick up 60 bags of lime. You could, um, you know, your seed and, and all the equipment. And nobody wants to spread that much lime by hand, or however you want to do it. Yeah, it <laughs> always to do this process where everybody has a sprayer, for the most part, for doing glyphosate and, and other things. So why not make it convenient? And, and again, the product just works. It's... Kenton, you want to talk about the, the particle size impurity as long as we're on the line topic? Yeah, and, um, and Doug, explain the differences of, of why it reacts quicker. Doug, you already touched on that. And, um, you know, you mentioned what Eric said and it really hit you in that first meeting. And that's really, really one of the biggest parts of why the line works. 
and you know we've got some videos that we've made already talking about the science and, and why it works but really to simplify it it is any line product is all about particle size and purity we've we've, we've said it a million times um, and, and we'll say it a million times more that's really how this product works um, it's just extremely fine extremely small and with that we get a much faster reaction it's not magic it's not snake oil um, there's nothing wrong with pell lime or ag lime but you know you said it how long is it going to take to react and how many food plotters uh plan ahead that much to have it help them you know when 10 percent yeah and 10%. how many how, how many guys even know that fact that it takes that long to begin with so then they're not getting the results and now it's your fault and it's not theirs you know well, yeah. it's, it's, why, they don't have the education the determination why why are the weed yeah you know why are my weeds growing much faster well that'll happen sometimes no matter what you do but mm -hmm. uh but yeah, exactly. Just knowing, you know, what tools you have and, and what you should be using. Right tool for the right job, we always say. And so, you know, we, we used the liquid lime for, I mean, years before we really launched uh, Plot Doctor as we know it now. Um, and of course, we used it for years before we launched it. And, uh, you know, we've always said the, the liquid lime really, I, I, it was invented for food plotters. It was made for food plotting. Works great in an ag field, uh, but in an ag field, you know, lots of times you can get out there with bulk size equipment, bulk size spreaders, right? There's a lot of other things that we can talk about. But when you're talking about a, a back in the woods, hard to access, uh, half, acre. half acre, quarter acre, you know, the, you nailed it. Some of the good plots, you you don't have any other options other than a four wheeler with a sprayer on it. Right. You, you can't take a trailer or a pickup truck filled with Pell lime or, or, you know, ag lime, ag size sprayer or a uh, bulk spray. And that was, and honestly, Captain, that was the biggest selling point. When I share that with a customer that you can do everything by sitting on your butt on a four wheeler. Oh man, they get giddy. Um, <laughs> it, 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 to them, it's a no brainer. Um, and, and especially a lot of, I mean, I hate to say this, but a lot of our customers are, of my age, they don't want to be sitting there and chucking, you know, 200 pounds of fertilizer and a ton of mint of lime. That's 40 um, bags. Yeah. Doug, yeah, Doug I'm, I'm a lot younger than you, and I don't want to be doing that. Nobody wants well, to be throwing <laughs> the lime if they don't have to. <laughs> right, right. Well, and a, a valid point. And, and, you know, and back to what you just nailed on, Ken, it's instant gratification. So, uh, and that makes us look good. And it also, and, and, you know, and we'll get into this a little bit here now coming up, but in about, the health of the plant you know right. and that's one thing that people fail to think about you know and that's why our blends are what we call busy and it's because we try to give your deer the best nourishment to what not just grow themselves and fawns it's to grow antlers and i mean i mean you know i mean i, I i'm gonna say what 20 percent of our, our our customers are meat hunters i would say but 80% are antler hunters, whether they want to admit it or not. You know, and I always tell everybody, I get customers come in a warehouse and they're like, well, I'm, I'm a meat hunter. I said, okay, so let me ask you this dumb question. So if a spike horn buck comes into your plot or a 180, you're going to shoot the spike horn because you like eating the meat. Well, of course not. Well, there you go. So you know what? Don't, don't, don't sit there and throw yourself under the bus either because we are all, I don't want to say greedy, we're all environmentalists, I mean, to an extent, and we're all, we're hunters, okay? But, you know, it still is a man thing, and it is, that's just the way it is. So There's something it, about seeing that deer grow two, three, four years. Oh, 100%. Steve. Property and see how they mature. It, it, there's a, there's a art to that, right? Or, oh, or, and there's more and more of that, Steve. And, and, that's, and that's, the that's the thing, even with low pH sometimes, it depends on what you're trying to plant, but you could still get something to grow, like clover can grow in pretty low pH sometimes, it just depends, but at the same time, sure it can grow, but if it, do, it, doesn't, if it doesn't have the nutritional value that it would have if it had a higher pH, and you're not really doing your deer, you know, you're doing your deer a disservice too, so getting the pH right, which is, I guess we call this, this segment of the, of the podcast, Food Plot for Dummies, that's what lime's for. It's it's to neutralize your soils, to raise pH. If you got a super low acidic soil, that's what this lime does. And yeah, you can use barn lime, pelletized lime, all that stuff. But this this is like a I don't know. When I used it for the first time, it was like a uh, like one of those aha moments. It's like it's this because every I, I've been out there and I've spread 20, 40 bags of lime by hand. It's a it's a pain in the ass. So when you could do yeah. something like this and 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 build better soil for your deer, ultimately help your deer grow and get bigger. 
I mean, it's not, it's not magic, but it's one of my favorite products to use. And I'm not just sitting here plugging it to plug it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. You know, if, if it was something I didn't believe in either. And I got, how many jugs did you just give me, uh, Doug? I just, oh, yeah. I, I just use this stuff. So it makes the process a lot simpler, if anything else. Well, yeah. it's the same calcium carbonate that's in egg lime and pell lime. Correct. It's just a much finer particle size, so the reaction is quicker. So stepping back to that for a second on the application, uh, I don't want to confuse the public here. So when you're working your plots, you want to apply this to the soil at the end. You don't want to put the lime down and then disc until cultivate because now you've moved that fine particle deeper into the soil the roots don't have a chance for that pH adjustment so the lime is all, always goes on after you're ready to seed or right after you seed spray it right onto the soil so just paint it white hey, hey, hey Doug yeah how deep do you recommend your most of your seeds in your line uh, go into the soil you always tell people well it's seed diameter times two in the ground that's right. what I always tell everybody now the one thing that I do do different, Steve, that you just mentioned um, is, is putting it on top. Um, I, and I cheat, and I know you, I know some people probably don't like this. There's a lot of times I will put the, the lime with the GT. But here's the deal. I'm only tilling two inches. A lot of guys set their tiller or their disc. You know, I tell people, don't get it in the ground too deep. I don't, and I preach this, do not over till ever if you can. Less is always more. So if I go and spray on, like I said, I spray one day, I till the next day, you know, so moral of the story is when I'm tilling that lime in, you know, if I got grass or any type of vegetation, you know, that stuff ain't going in the ground very far. It's going to be right there, you know, so the roots are going to have access to it. Now, now I have some customers, believe it or not, that have, you know, this that are 30 foot this that they disc a field and I look at them, I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, you know, that, that's a little excessive. Uh, well, I got that big equipment or a farmer did it for me. Well, then, you know, Steve, what you're just saying, yeah, then you're going to want to put the lime on top, okay? Because, you know, if you've got 18-inch disc blades or 20-some inch disc blades, you know, right. you know you're, you're going 8, 10 inches down at a crack. Well, that ain't helping you none, buddy, you know? And, and so, you can probably get away with that maybe the first year or two, maybe, but eventually you're going to see diminishing food plots. Your soil, your, you know, your soil oh. is going to go way down. And then you're really going to have to supplement your soil just to get it back to where you want it. But I guess you got to do what you got to do sometimes. Or the education portion of this is more important so that people know that they, they don't have to do that. You know, it doesn't make right. sense to do that. Well, correct. Right. My, my point about asking you, Doug, um, you know, where you put the seed is that's really where we want the pH adjustment because, you know, that's really our game to win. Um, the, the lime will work great down 12 inches. It'll mm -hmm. adjust the pH down there. But I tell you what, it's going to take quite a while for the roots to get down there. Well, and, that, and that's a valid point. So, okay, so let me ask you this. If you spray it on top, which is something that I'm, you know, I'm even curious and in, how much does it leach on per rain? You know, like how far does it go down per rain? Does it go down? I mean, obviously like N or nitrogen usually goes quick, okay? Right. But now lime is a different, a different particle and different molecule. I imagine it's got to stay, it doesn't sink like you would have like an end product, correct? Well, no, and so um, it's going to vary in soil type. It's going to vary based off of moisture, but I tell you, we've done a lot of uh, poke and prod and testing over the years. Um, if you put out a typical, you know, two to three gallon application, uh, for one, you know, another point on the lime and, and the trade-offs between the liquid versus the dry is it does react instantaneously, but it is a much quicker reaction. It's not going to be there for, you know, four or five years. So we've had a few people say, hey, you know, my pH is still high the year after. Typically that's it after a fall application, a fall food plot. So if you're going out there in August and spraying three gallons of lime, you might actually have some residual there the following spring. But typically we're gonna tell everyone that it's it's a, a year, an annual, application. an annual application, an annual adjustment. And so if you spray in the spring for us, for a spring food plot, say in, in April or May, and uh, we get a typical rain season, uh, I would say you can see adjustment down six, eight inches, no problem. But again, okay. every time it rains, every time you put some moisture out there, it's gonna drive that down. But you're also gonna be reacting with, with what's in the soil, the calcium and the hydrogen. As it goes down, correct. correct. So, yes. you know, if you've got a higher pH, you might be able to drive it lower. But if you're sitting at, you know, a 4.8 pH, you're, 
going to get a lot of reaction as that goes down. And again, that whole balancing equation is going to take uh, take place faster the more it goes down. So Okay, so here's one thing that I did last year. I, I had a plot that was 5-5, uh, five, five, um, and it needed, it was a one-acre plot, needed two ton of lime to the acre, according to eggs. Um, I went on, I sprayed two gallons on that plot, um, and just for the heck of it, I went back and I soil tested it the next year, which would have been uh, in May, a couple months ago. Um, I went and I checked my, my test, and it was at 6-1, and it didn't need any lime. Yeah. And I'm like, 6-1, no lime, and I'm like, wait a minute. All right, so I'm using this liquid. I'm like, how in the world can this be? And I don't know, forgive me if I'm wrong. Now, it was in a tank plot, which is going to be the turnips and the radishes, Okay. Now, I'm just assuming that, you know, the deer can only eat so far down, which is going to leave a majority of that root, which is basically the bulb in the ground. And I was just thinking if that root basically died, you know, obviously it died and it rotted, and I dissed it up and I checked it, because this I did this after I tilled it, because I was going to put soybeans in, um, I realized that maybe that was staying in the root structure, and, and as it decayed and rotted in the spring, did that end up, you know, dispersing? I don't know, and I'm not an agronomist, but that was the only thing I could come up with. Does that make sense or no? So what's actually happening is when, in the food time world, simplified terms, uh, you know, lime is not something that the plant takes. Lime adjusts uh, uh uh, an amount of hydrogen or hydrogen ions are in the cell. And the benefit is more to biology than it is actually to the plant. Okay, when a plant grows, uh, a plant basically, 60 to 70% of what that plant produces, actually, it'll put back in the ground for biology to, uh, in a roundabout way, feed itself. Okay, that biology will help bring in nutrients to the plant. And so if you have a low pH environment, okay, that is detrimental to the biology's home. Okay, that biology around that root zone will actually change the pH to uh, a conducive uh, level for it to live in, okay? But if your pH is low, okay, it's harder for that biology to rebound and make that pH in that root zone. I mean, we're talking microscopic areas around, um, around roots, okay? Okay. When that pH is low, it's, it's harder for that biology to survive and thrive around that plant, that root zone, okay? When you start to change that pH and get it to a place where it's conducive for that biology to live, okay, now that soil is, is coming alive more, okay, you're, you're getting more colony forming units in that soil. And so over time, as you improve your, your soil health, that biology can keep that pH up longer, okay? So, so basically you let your, allow your roots to actually absorb all the new nutritional value. And it's kind of like if you have a low pH, let's say you have a 5.5, five, and you go put 100 pounds of urea on there, you're going to get, you're not going to be able to even use a portion of it, correct? Because the, the roots are not going to be able to, to basically break it down. To your, your, absor your absorption rate would be a lot less, basically, is what, kind of what you're getting at. Mm -hmm. and, and right? Is that correct, guys? Yeah, well, and the best thing you can do for any soil is put more roots there and keep roots there because part of the conversation with the lime, actually most of the conversation, as Andy mentioned, isn't necessarily about feeding the plant directly. It's about, uh, it's about improving soil structure. And that's really where a lot of guys fail and, and they bypass that. And then they, they put out you know a bunch of fertility, whether they do or don't, but if they are, we're wasting a lot of those dollars if, and we might not be getting any of it because we haven't solved the soil structure issue. And again, that plays into biology, it plays into roots, it plays into the, the chemical structure of that soil. It's got nothing to do with the physical compactness of it. But yeah, I mean, in a simplified, you know. I would say when it comes to food plotting, there's two types of people that provide two types of extremes. It's buy the seed, throw it in the ground, and leave it and they usually have they usually have one or two good years of, of plots okay then you have the other guy where money is no option he'll go out and if it says to put down 100 pounds of fertilizer he's going to put down three four you know <laughs> yeah, or so, and so two years he has really good plots well both of these two extremes 
okay, this guy didn't take care of anything, so now his plots in third, fourth, fifth year look like crap. And then the guy that over applied fertilizer by three, four times, now his stuff is looking like crap. They both meet in the middle where they had detrimental effects on biology. Okay, the one guy didn't have enough living plant material there to keep feeding biology, keep organic matter levels up. Okay, so now that soil health is diminished. Okay, the guy who over applied fertility, he put such a mass amount of, of salts, chlorides, bicarbs in his pot, and usually an excess of amount of nitrogen, he burnt up his organic matter reserves very, very quickly there. Okay, so it's it's trying to meet in the middle. You don't, you can't just throw seed in the ground and expect it to be beautiful. There's only a couple rare places I've ever seen that happen. And usually it's a type of plot where it's wet most of the time, but you got in that one dry year. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, um, the, lost my train of thought there. Yeah, um, it's all about a balance, right? We're yeah. Trying to so keep a balance trying, in trying to meet in the middle. So you, you got to spend a few dollars, but you don't, you don't have to spend more than your buddies to have the, the best looking, you know, magazine front page cover worthy plot, you know? Well, right. The deer don't care what it looks like. They just care about, is it there? Yeah. You know, a lot of the plots that, I mean, a lot of my customers, I got some guys that are, you know, and that was one of the biggest problems that I had was they want, you know, they think more seed is better. And I'm like, less is more. So I got to explain that to tone it down, first and foremost, back to feeding the, you know, the plots, you know, like, you know, like you were saying, which leads me to another real quick question. Explain a little bit to my customers about how much water to how much lime that you can get through a sprayer because they are back to, well, I don't have the time. So let me just put like 10 gallons of lime in this 20 gallon sprayer and add the water. And uh, boy, you know, it really doesn't spray that well, really. You know, so, you know, so, you know, so explain a little bit about the mixture so the customer understands. Well, again, goes back to read the directions, right? Uh, we've, we've explained it very well on the back of the bottle on the label. Now there's instructions right there on the back, but a minimum of one gallon of, gallon of lime in 10 gallons of water, minimum. 20 gallons to one gallon is ideal, but you can go with a 10 to one. So one okay. gallon of lime, 10 gallons of water. And again, follow the mixing instructions. We did a YouTube video last year, Doug, where we went through that in great detail. It's up on YouTube. Um, so yeah, if you do I mean, that, you'll have no issues and spray it all out. And then, well, and then last, out your sprayer. Yes. Yeah, and lastly, when you're done, put another five gallons of water in there and spray that out to clean yes. the pump out. If that yeah. calcium, it will solidify when it dries. So get oh your, yeah, get your turn to rock. Out. You know, I mean, like you said, you're spraying liquid rock, you know? Really. So, you know, and you know, so that, like I said, it, it, it's a great product, guys. I, 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 you know, and I know my customers are starting to swear by it because they're seeing a big, uh, a big, a big difference. Um, so that leads us to the foliar. Um, so explain a little bit about your foliar and what cases it's good for. Uh, what do you recommend? Uh, you know, you know, ups and downs, and we can kind of go from there. So, so yeah, before, before we jump into that, Doug, let me just kind of back up. Um, so, you know, every good food plot, start with the soil sample. You said it, I'll say it again. We, we like to, the best food plot doesn't happen by accident or, or very, very seldom does it happen by accident, right? So let's act based off of some information from your actual plot, not stabbing in the dark. Um, that'll help us with our lime recommendation. I get it all the time. Well, how much lime do I need to use? Well, what's your pH? I have no idea. All right, well, if you tell me that, almost every day of the week, I'm going to tell you to probably put out per half acre food plot at least a gallon. So a couple gallons per acre, if you don't know. Um, but again, let's base it off of something that we actually know. That'll also help us with the fertility. And so, you know, the whole plot doctor line now that we've got, the plot and the pail, the foliar, the dry, the calcium, the, the liquid lime, all of it is meant to simplify this whole process. Okay, um, guys can use some dry along with this stuff. They, they can use some Pell Lime if they want to, but again, all things being equal, if you follow our recommendation, especially if you've got a, a soil sample, us being agronomists, right, we do this every day. If we can look at what's going on in your plot and in your soil, 
pick out the right seed for that situation and then not only feed it properly, feed it properly chances are we're going to have some success. And right. that's, again, what we've tried to simplify this process, okay? And so, you know, again, going back to now starting to talk about feeding it, uh, we'd like to have some information to help you with that. But if not, uh, again, we've got a pretty simplified process based off of your type of seed, whether it be an annual or a perennial, to give you a good program going into it. And so with that, um, I'll uh, dry first before the bowl here. Yeah. That starts that planting, right? Yeah, Doug, if you don't mind, I guess I'd like to start. We'll start with the dry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nope, nope. So, That's the bomb, so go ahead. That, that's good line, you know, the flagship of the plot doctor line. Uh, that kind of comes first again because it addresses the soil, but then we get into the fertility. And uh, so dry, foliar, and then uh, the calcium. And uh, I'll let actually Andy talk about uh, a few of those options, why we do it, where we do it. Uh, so, can I take it from there, but I can tell you. So, we have our, our plot up and dry product. Our formulations actually changed a little bit over the last two years or so. Um, again, trying to make it more user friendly. But uh, the plot up and dry product is it's basically more or less 90% convenience. Okay, you're already out there, you're spreading the seed. Um, you have the ability to put something out there with it. You know, why walk across your pot another time? Uh, why go get another implement to go across the pot another time? You can throw it in with your, your spreader, with your seed, spread it all at the same time. Um, it, it's, it's formulated to be a very nice starter blend to get it up and out of the ground. Um, and again, the placement is, is right where you put your seed. Um, and again, Doug, you said, you know, less is more on your seed. So a guy buys a bag, a four pound bag of seed or eight pound bag of seed for a half an acre and he makes a pass and a half and he's out. Oops. Yep. So if you dump a, a bottle of the dry right in with that seed, it gives you a, a, a filler. This versus it. Yep, yep, yep. Does that seed out better plus you're fertilizing at the same time. So, so it's basically like a good starter fertilizer for the customer, basically, yeah. correct? Yeah, it's actually a 646.5 analysis on the back label if you look at that, and it is a carbon-based fertility. It's mm -hmm. seed safe, which is, uh, you'll have a hard time. You cannot put just any old fertilizer with seed or you'll do a lot of damage. Right. And so that's one of the benefits of, of the Plot Doctor Dry. And, and again, it's a 2.2 pound container. So if you're putting that in with your four pound bag of seed or most, you know, quarter or half acre plots, you're going to be, you know, increasing that by 50%. It really helps you disperse that seed and that material better over the plot. I know we've done that. You've always preached that, Doug. It's a great filler. Sometimes guys, a lot of guys will say, well, I've just been using sand. Yeah. yeah. Kitty litter. I've heard it all already. Yeah. yeah. So, so Kenton, you you mentioned carbon-based fertility, and for the general public, they don't that just kind of glosses right over the top and don't yeah. know what, what that really means. But you want to explain the importance of carbon in this in the system, and why and why this is a, a better fertility approach. So all our fertility products, uh, except for the, the liquid lime, because that actually we need to have a reaction. Um, but all of our fertility products are reacted with some sort of carbon material, okay? And reacted means what? What that? What that carbon does, okay? Is uh, to simplify it for people, I guess, that don't work in the profession, okay? Uh, in soils, you have negatives and positives. Okay? Right. Plants, you have negatives, positives, okay? Well, it's like magnets: negatives and positives attract, okay? Once they attract, they normally have a reaction or form a compound. Um, and then once they're in that form, they're not actually available. They're not available to the plant. Okay. Most of the nutrients that a plant uptakes, it has to be a, a single nutrient. Um, so all of our fertility products, after you after you apply them, they're staying plant available. Okay, that carbon source, number one, can be used by the plant, it can be used by biology in the soil. Um, but then it also protects that nutrient and, and keeps it available longer to the plant. Yeah, that carbon gives it a neutral charge so the soil doesn't use So the reason it the reason behind us, okay, most guys are used to putting out 50, 100, 150, you know, excess amounts of, of material. So when they look at something like this and they say, 
you want me to go with 2.2 pounds. And it's just, it's, it's a mind boggle again, right? They're like, yeah, right, yeah. I've never been told this. My, yeah. my soul test doesn't say it either. You know, it says that I got to use yeah, triple 17 or right. triple 20 or, you know, and yeah, you can tell them to get to the soil sample, follow the recommendations. But again, it, it's always um, opposite of what they've been told or what they've been used to. Or their grandpa used to farm and he thinks that's crazy, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. So you know, but things things have changed and so again our company has revolved around on the agro, agricultural side as well, about very efficient products and, and no baggage with it and nothing that we don't need. Um, and so again that's where these products come from. Um, but that's that's the, the efficiency most- is a big word. And, and what we're trying to do. Because yeah. I, I like that work because you know what? It's no different than if you can spray everything or do everything that's even not even just a product. It's efficient. You know, mm-hmm. less is more. No tilling has become kind of a pretty common practice in a lot of places. And that's because it's efficient, less work. You know, so you're spot on. Disrupt the biology that's already in the soil by no tilling, right? Right. Pull that over. And, pull that soil over. You're going to be killing your biology. So. And, and and you're not losing the, the moisture if you're if you know at the plant of or at the point of planting. That's another big big point too. Yeah, that is a good point. Correct. Mm-hmm. Normally we don't have enough as it is, so why right. waste? You don't have to. Exactly. And what would you see? I think you mentioned it last podcast, Doug. For every inch that you work up, you lose what? Like you, you're bringing up three to four inches yeah. of moisture. You know. Um. So. You know, and we live what I call Sandville because almost the northern half of Wisconsin is sand, and actually, even I would say eighty percent of Wisconsin is sand. We live in the central sand, so we live in the cold. <laughs> you know, so I mean, and 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 so I tell that's why I do minimal tillage as much as I possibly can, and that's another reason why I like to till in. I like to spray one day and till the next day because I want to put them green plants back in. Because them green plants, as they rot and decay, they're not just rotting and decaying to feed your plants. They're also holding moisture. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're building up your soil. I've had soil that was, I'm talking, I call almost like beach sand. And I planted winter rye in there two years in a row. And when it got, you know, a foot and a half tall, I put it back in, put it back in. And all that sand actually has some color to it. And it has some firmness to it. So, you know, it's all about conditioning your soil. Because, like I say, you know, uh, (laughs) I tell all my customers this. If you're a food plotter, you're a farmer, and farming sucks. So, you know, just, just let you know ahead of time because, you know, it's going to come down to pipe, and it, it is what it is. But, you know, it's kind of what you're kind of touching on, Andy. You know, if people don't understand what carbon does and it doesn't understand people, you know, that's over their head. I mean, it just is. Right. So this is something that kind of we hope that the public can understand, but there is more to it than just throwing a seed in the ground and, Let's just throw some fertilizer on it and poke and hope. This, this is a whole nother world, you know? Right. Well, we're getting the same efficacy out of two, two and a half pounds that you do on a 50 pound. <coughs> so it's just about efficiencies. Exactly. Yeah, and, and don't feel bad if it's over your head because honestly, it's over most of the heads of, of people that farm yeah. for a living. Exactly. You know, right. it's, it's different for them too. You know, oh, it's a science is really and, what it and, is. And that goes back to really why we're here today, you know, is we're all busy. We don't have time to sit and figure all this stuff out, right? <laughs> You've got a few hours on a weekend to get it done because you got to get home and do this, that, the other thing, or you got to right. drive four hours to your property. And so, again, I'll say it again. The reason we're doing this is to try to simplify this whole process. And, yeah, we're absolutely using technology and some great tools to help yeah. us do that. Well, and it makes it more efficient. And you're going to have a better quality product all the way around from the health of the plant to the health of the deer to the health of the soil to everything so you're improving the environment you know tenfold all within a few couple you know a few i want to say uh, easy steps but easier steps than in, a, in, in, a fra- in, a, in a fraction of the time and you know in oh. comparison to some of the old old practices that's the main thing that right. is the big thing it, yeah. it really is um because if we can we can take that that time requirement down again you've got more time to do other stuff uh it's just a win-win so right so yeah that's the draw you want to talk about fully you know yeah okay so uh foliar um 
extremely versatile product. We call it a foliar, uh, which, you know, the, the, the word foliar kind of designates it should be sprayed on the foliage uh, after the stuff has emerged. And that's the way that we've designed it. Um, typically, we're, we're, we're going to tell you, wait till the stuff is up two, three inches, actually get some leaf surface out there, no matter what you, what you uh, plan, um, in order to get the uptake. Uh, but honestly, you know, we've got a ton of guys that'll put this stuff out on the ground with nitrogen, uh, with other products, and that's perfectly fine. You know, again, uh, <laughs> guys, the, we're going to tell you how maybe we design this, but you know, take it and run. You know, every plot's different. Every scenario is different. There's flex. I spray it on before. I, I oh. have, I honestly have no choice. And the, and the right. meaning is, is because it's almost impossible in a lot of my places to go back and top dress. Correct. Uh, it, it, it just is. So, you, you know, you've got to work with what you have and how you have it. Um, so I spray it. I mix it with my end and my wand and I spray it oh, on top and I'm done. No, yeah, and, and you really can't mess it up, and that's why I say it's a really flexible product. You know, we, we've got it in uh, two quart containers and gallon containers, um, and quite honestly, it can come in any container size you want. But for the typical half acre food pot, a couple quarts, and that is going to be fine, um, or a couple applications, you know, then get a gallon. You know, if you can get out there and spray it multiple times during the season, you know, over a three month period, do it. Um, you know, the old adage, less more often is always better than more less often. Going back to, you know, how many times a day do you eat? Do you eat a giant breakfast? And I eat a lot. So, you know, it's a little bit different, you well, know. You fall uh, into that well, Doug. You're yeah. a grazer. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm a grazer. There you go. I love that, Steve. Oh, yeah. So I've been hanging around cattle enough, you know, I know how that works. You, you eat more than once, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and plants are no different, right? They're going to do better if you feed them more than once in a season, you know, so the old adage of I'm going to put a four or 500 pound application like Andy was talking about up front versus going out with some then at plan and then some, you when know, you spray your weeds or correct. when you spray for your seeds, you know, when, the, when, when you're, you know, shortly after germination and your plants are up two, three inches. And then if warranted, go back again when the stuff's six, eight inches or after you mow. Um, again, just, you know, play with this stuff. Every plot is different, but that is going to be a better approach, uh, generally than a single application and just loading it up. So, okay. And that's, I'm going to touch on something here really quickly. Cause I, I, um, is there anything that you guys recommend that you use that, you know, will neutralize cleaning out your sprayer? Because I get this a lot. I use ammonia. <laughs> I know it's pretty abrasive. Um, it works for me, um, but I have a lot of customers, and now back to the foliar, and it's the only reason why I'm bringing this up. Um, if you're going to go back and you're going to spray your foliar on a, on a, and I've had this happen many a times with customers, um, they do not clean out their sprayer thoroughly from the GT, okay? They say they did um, wrong, okay? Um, did you, like, wash it out, wash it out? Uh, well, I rinsed it out. Well, there's a difference between washing and rinsing. So is there something that you guys recommend that you can you know, share with the public? I don't care if it's, you know, an old wives' tale, whatever you think is going to work. You can buy it at a grocery store that you recommend that you can put in to clean out your sprayer thoroughly before you go back in top dress or top spray. Honestly, so I use uh, some Simcoe has a neutralizing uh, it's a dry material. Um, it's like 16, 20 bucks. Yeah. The drug of stuff. It does like eight 25 gallon teams or something like that. Right. Um, I use that. Um, most of the time, if you're rinsing thoroughly, you don't need to use that neutralizing agent. I do it every once in a while just to make sure that, okay, if I did have any residue, if anything's soaking the, some of the rubber or the plastic, just to kind of and nuke it, but it's funny you bring that up. I was actually fishing with a buddy last night and I was telling him about some of the, the products in foliars and stuff. And he goes, I can't spray that. I says, Why? He's like, Well, my my sprayer is just for Roundup. And so he'd actually he had no idea that he could actually use the same thing. sprayer. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> kidding. He used the Roundup in there, like that, that sprayer is just designated for herbicide. <laughs> I'll be darned. So, yeah, well, so everybody, I don't, 
everybody gets information somewhere so I, how they how they uh, interpret it is is much different but again they do you go to fleet farm um i don't i'm sure like around the world like uh tyson's and all those are you know, like around but for people outside the midwest any farm store that sells soon cooked fares they should have a uh, a neutralizer that you recommend that they uh, use? Fleet, even fleet farms got tank cleaner by the egg stuff you know they've got the banjo okay. thing stuff uh yeah okay. i mean you know you could probably use just vinegar or you know something a little acidic to clean it but you know that really doesn't become an issue unless you let yourself sit and that that's i think where people get in trouble with uh, the glyphosate is you know they, they it throw the it in the overnight. tank they go and spray and then they didn't measure you know again i've done this before too or uh, shoot i miscalculated or the plot wasn't the right size because most plots are not you know a perfect square where we can measure. right you know we're out there with the tape measure and doing our, our calculations you know exactly three quarters of an acre or whatever so yeah if you've got stuff left over you know and you plan on putting other stuff in the tank don't let it sit over the weekend or a month or who knows when you know so clean the stuff out use it rinse, rinse it. it rinse it thoroughly and you won't have any issue and if mm -hmm. you don't want to do that then i recommend you get two tanks you know, or something right so you have one for glyphosate and herbicides and spraying to kill stuff and you've got one for making plants happy yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay because i get that like i said i get this all the time and i just tell people i and i know what you're talking about andy because i've used that before for you know and, and it works good um, but I just found if I take ammonia, which is, like I said, it's pretty damn abrasive as far as on the nostrils. Um, but that stuff will cut through that, pretty much wash anything, you know. Um, and it seems to work well. And I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, but, you know, to each his own. And you're right on it. You know, honestly, Kent, I got how many people that leave spray in their sprayer? I, you know, and, and listen, males are, are lazy. They're lazy. <laughs> yeah, we're not. You know, you're preaching to the choir. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, you know, I don't, uh, I'll yeah. do it tomorrow. You know, and then three weeks later. Yeah, uh, tomorrow. Uh, yeah. Oh shit. Was, I get it. I get it. But I, I get that. I get this question a lot, and that's why I wanted to ask you guys if you guys had something you recommended so that I can, you know, we can relay it to the public. But um, so that that was a good question. So, but anyways, okay. So back to fertility. Um, yeah. okay, we talked on a foliar. We got on the dry. We got the lime. Uh, what's your next uh, product? Calcium. calcium. Okay. Lots of calcium. Straight 20% calcium, reactive calcium. Again, that means that that elemental charge is protected. So you can, it is foliar available, right? Plant available, I should say. Uh, Ken, you explained this really well. We have some videos on our Facebook page that explain this uh, very thoroughly. But most people look at the calcium product or they'll look at the lime product and they'll get them both confused because they're like, all right, my soil test says I need calcium, but then I also need lime. So is it, are they doing the same thing since they're both calcium? Um, no, usually not the case. So the lime, the calcium carbonate is, is an amendment. It is, you want to look for a reaction. Okay. But now we have a calcium plant nutrition product. Okay where we, we don't want a reaction. We want it to stay just for straight calcium for plant nutrition, calcium uptake, okay? For root growth, the plant can't <clears throat> grow a root without calcium. Um, okay. The, nothing, nothing in the plant grows without calcium. Calcium right. makes up the cell well, well, well. So there's calcium in liquid lime, yep. but then there's calcium by itself. Correct. Yep. You know, the difference, the main difference being one is reacted, this simplifies it. One is reacted and one is non-reacted. Okay. Okay, so one, one is reactive in the soil and one is not reactive in the soil. The calcium is not reactive in the soil. So that whole, that whole uh, you know, uh, protection of the charge thing that Andy talked about before, yeah. the calcium product for plant nutrition yeah. is encapsulated. Okay, meaning we want it to be available for that plant to use. Okay. When we, when we spray it out, whether it's on the leaf tissue, whether it's on the soil, we don't want a reaction to happen, and there won't be a reaction that happens with the calcium because it is non-reactive, strictly for plant nutrition. This, this, and again, I can see it by looking at you, Doug, this is where people get confused. 
So I am I am so in left field right now, and I'm batting right-handed, and I'm in a mess. Hey, so <laughs> okay, so do me a favor. As I'm explaining this, at least change your eyebrows. Need to come up like, oh, I, I could. Well, I, I, well, I, I, when I get it, I will. Okay, I'm just not there yet. Okay, so. You know, when you start going negative, positive, now you're talking to this old farmer that just throw more down than it used to be, okay? So um, you lost me at negative, positive, charge, and it's all, so let's go back and re-explain it in layman's terms for us dumb fat guys, okay? Because I don't, I, 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 you lost me. You, yeah, you I'll, let Andrew, I'll let Andy go over what he explained earlier, and he'll simplify it for you. Okay. No problem. Okay. I'm actually going to give you a little bit of background first on why we decided to bring product with calcium onto the product. Okay, so I I wanted to really try and figure out what the public thought about when they when they did food plots. Now, Facebook is a great research tool because you get every walk of life, and there is no question that it's too dumb to ask on Facebook. So everybody is very very honest there and you can really get a, a visualization of what people go through when they see the products because we're not the only company out there you know there's millions of people doing the full food bot thing so they're like well does anybody use this does anybody use this my stroll test was this but um a lot of guys don't know what to do once they've established like a perennial plot okay they went through they fertilized it their soil test said all right this is what you need and they planted it and they're like well it didn't tell me what to do the second or the third or the fourth year after that so you know what do i do now okay and you know some guys have issues with longevity with their perennial pots whether it's chicory clover alfalfa you know whatever you got mostly nitrogen fixed plants is what you're talking about basically right okay okay well, i wanted to bring on pot active calcium for the perennial pot once you have something established, okay, now we need the maintenance it, okay? Now the kicker is, is we're planting these, these quarter, half, one acre pots that are designed to be eaten. You know, it's totally different than the agriculture side of things where I have a large field, it doesn't get eaten, it doesn't get diminished, okay? We need to have something that keeps that system going longer because, you know, we don't want to be spending 40, 50 bucks uh every two years one plant perennial pot when we could stretch it out another year another two years okay so by adding the calcium in that system we can we can force root growth further we can force foliar growth further okay after those deer come through and then mold off the pot we, we can replenish that system with the calcium so if you put the calcium in the foliar on a plant which is your clover, alfalfa, chicory, whatever your your even beans, I'm sure. Okay, that is going to increase the value, the food relative food value of the plant. You know what percentage ballpark? No, I'm not. I'll do forage tests on uh, on food plots. Normally. Okay, good. Um, <laughs> but dairy guys do it all the time. Yep. Well, right, and that's why I'm asking because I do that with some of my food that I go and get tested for my beef cattle. So I know where I'm at as far as, you know, digestibility, where are they getting their proteins or carbs? What, what are they pulling in out of it? And we, and I know a lot of dairy people put that, you know, they test their alfalfa. They will test to find out where they're at nutritional value, how many percent protein they have. Cause everything is back to like when we started this out, it's a science. They want to know, you know, a cow's going to digest this much deer, same rumen basically. Um, you know, what are they going to intake? What are they not going to intake? I have have customers that you're going to laugh at this. They spray the, cal uh, the liquid lime right on their clover and alfalfa plots, um, and the deer eat them twice as fast. Um, now, is it because they're getting the calcium out of it, or is it because they are getting a more nutritious plant? You know, yeah. these are things that I would have to say it's probably a more palatable, nutritious plant, and it could be um, that they're lacking calcium. You know, because and I always when I do my seminars, I always explain this to people. You know, we deer are mammals and we're mammals. And if you're craving something, you're lacking something. Yep. So if they're going to eat something a little bit more aggressively, it's usually because they get a taste for it and it is fulfilling their lackings. So I'm thinking that the calcium, and I think I'm starting to get this, 
if you got a healthier plant and the plant is absorbing this calcium or taking it into its root structure, it is making it a more palatable, better for you uh, type of vegetation where the deer are going to obviously like it more. And I found it's all out uh, the more your protein is in your plant, the less they'll eat um, because they fill up uh, honestly on a better quality product. So, you, you know, it, and that's what I always say about, you know, back to you do this whole lime thing, the whole fertilization thing, the healthier your plants are, the better it is for your deer and the less they will eat. Uh, and that I, I've, I've witnessed that in deer farms when we spray deer farms with stuff. I can, I he even said their consumptions are way down because they are getting more nutritional value out of what they're eating and they got more relative digestibility in the room and that they can break it down and absorb more product out of it. And that's why our, our mineral cells so good because we noticed that there can, everything they eat in the room and with the probiotic, they can break that down and absorb more. So I think I'm on the right page now. I think I finally like ding, ding, ding. I, I feel it did a little bit here now. Cause, but you lost me at first there when you start doing negative and positive that, you know, uh, that, but, but now I, I think I got it. To, to piggyback off you, Doug, especially for those guys doing the smaller food plots and things like that, if you really think about it, you use these products, you get a better nutritional value of your plant, fills up a deer faster. You really don't need as much forage per acre technically because you have a higher quality plant. So those guys who have a smaller plot, these are the guys that really need to make sure that they're using these products too because you're getting more bang for your buck out of each plant versus the plants that you wouldn't have used these products on. So if you got a small plot and you got limited forage per acre already, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice if you're not using these type of products to ultimately make a healthier plant and grow bigger deer, grow, you know, whatever. Right, 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 right. You're doing it. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Exactly. Yeah, plain, plain and simple. If you've got 20 deer and a half acre plot, they're probably going to mow it down. Yeah. So quality, <laughs> quality versus quantity, you know, if, if your deer are getting what they need, they're not going to need to eat as much. Right. And so I think we've all seen that in places or maybe noticed that. I know I have over the years, it's, and it, that's not a rule across the board, but, but yeah, the old adage, you know, quality, not quantity does work in food plots as well as in, you know, feeds on, on huge farms. That's why they pay so much attention to it, right? Why right, do they right. get more milk out of certain feeds versus others? Right, and, that, and that's the agricultural, you know, farming, because, you know, back to your farming again. So it's all going to be about diet, you know, relative digestibility, um, the healthier your dirt is, the healthier your plants are, the healthier, it all kind of, it's, you know, it's like, like, like Steve would always say, it's a science and it is, it, it, it and it's more to just poking hope and throwing it. And I think that's what we got across today. I mean, and the main thing of this whole scheme of things is, okay, what are we trying to accomplish as a deer hunter? And it's not just, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this, you know, it, you've got to think outside the box to be more efficient to have a better quality product and to honestly help your 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 ground and, and your property as a whole all the way around, you know? Yeah, and I mean, so we called ourselves Plot Doctor for a reason, not Plot DR, Plot Doctor. And I mean, it says on every product that we've got, the perfect prescription for your food plot. You know, well that, that you know. It's by design. Right? It's by design, right? Right, we right. We need to put that perfect prescription together every time, you know, goes back to a lot of the stuff we talked about today. The information, the soil, what are you planting in that plot? Annual, perennial, you know, all of these things come together. Right. We can make it as simple or as technical as you'd like. Um, again, our goal is to simplify the process. You know, I said that already, but, but yeah, some of these conversations, you know, they're, they're not black and white. They are pretty technical, right. but we can simplify them, again, with, with some of these basic conversations. And, and, and that's exactly what we're doing here today, because I think exactly. a lot of people that are going to be able to go back and listen to this are going to understand what we're trying to get across here. You know, um, it, it, it's it's not as difficult as, as it, you think it is. It's as difficult as you want to make it, yeah. you know. So everything is about being basically easy, um, easy to understand, easy to apply, easy to use. And like you guys got your plot in a pail, which obviously you just put up there, Steve. And that to me, I think, you know, back to educating the public because men don't read directions. Uh, so that actually kind of kind of helps a little bit, uh, actually a lot of it, I should say, and what we're trying to get across. And if you want to talk about that, Steve, a little bit, that would be yeah. a good thing too. So we've been talking about convenience and ease of use and all that. 
and, and uh, trying to simplify this whole process for hunters. So uh, this year we've come with a plot and a pail. So it's literally a plot and a pail. So uh, what you do, you decide what you're going to plant. Is it going to be an annual plot, a perennial plot, or a maintenance plot? So you, you choose that. You choose your seed. I want dead zone sweet broth, tank of this, checkmate, whatever it is. So in the pail will come your lime, one gallon of lime, your 2.2 pound of dry, your 64 ounces of foliar if it's an annual plot, and then your seed. And a stir stick and instructions. So everything all in there, everything ready to go. That for a half acre plot, even the receptacle to put the water in to put in your sprayer for your liquid product is all in one pail. Right. So, so that guy that says, geez, I don't know what I need for fertilizer, but I know I want to plant this seed. What do I do? You don't have to ask questions anymore. It's all in the plot. Yeah. The same with the with the perennial plot. You, you can pick it. It comes with a lime, a dry, and a 128 ounce or a gallon of foliar. So you need a little more foliar to amend. Mm -hmm. Mow your silver to your perennial, and then you put seed which seed you want. And then on the maintenance side, you get your lime, you get your calcium again, the liquid the calcium for, for plant calcium, and then a uh, hundred a gallon of the foliar as well. So you don't get seed with the maintenance one because you've already planted that that crop. Right, 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 right. So we made yeah. it very, very convenient. You don't have to guess, you don't have to ask, you just order what you need, and it all comes in one pail. So that's something that's new. We were going to bring that out at the shows, but it, with the COVID thing going on, all the shows have been canceled. Yeah. So here it is. Plot yeah. Pail. You can no, that's, that, that's great. Art. It's super simple. Yeah. So, no, so if anything else for everybody that's watching, if everything went completely over your head for the past hour, that should, yeah. simpl that should simplify it. That's what yes. you've got to go with. Yes. Brett, you're you're a valid point. point. You, yes. you said it exactly, Brett. Exactly. And that's that's exactly why we did it because we'd get phone calls, you know, where you try to sit on the phone literally a 45 minutes with the guy and uh, he doesn't know you, you don't know him. And at the end of it, he's, you know, maybe getting some of what you're saying, but, yeah. you know, like Doug, you lose him with the calcium, you lose him with the positives, the negative the soil stuff. So we said, you know, we just, we can't do this for everyone. It won't work. So right. how do you simplify this for guys? And make it easy for them to follow because some some guys are going to sit on on and, and do all the research and they'll soak this stuff up but i think a vast majority of guys just say give me what i need you know yes so you bungee that to the front and, of your four-wheeler and you got your sprayer on the back side of the four-wheeler and, and away you go and so that's what we did with plot and fail is we were giving you what you need and we can talk about that you know you can watch this podcast you can watch some of our videos on the plot doctor website right and educate yourself on different portions of this and maybe start piecing together a program that fits your plot better but mm -hmm. the generally is going to give you again what you need uh, well and there's more and more and i'm and i'm real i'm realizing this where a lot of my customers you know they were afraid to do any of this right. and yeah. i'm like i don't have time to come out and be planting your plots for you you know and, and so what i started to do which it turned into a, a good nightmare but it's working uh, I go and educate people. I go walk with them. I go and I help them, teach them, you know, this is how you spray. This is how you till. This is how you seed. This is how you roll. This is, and then once you do it once, you're on your own, right? right. You know, um, and if you got any questions, I'm only a text away. You know, I will answer your questions, but I can't be running 30 minutes to put in, you know, your two acre food plot because you're scared, you know? Right. You know what? You mess it up once or twice. Mm -hmm. Listen, it's life. You're going to be fine. You know, it's just you, you got to learn hands on. And then, you know, kind of, Steve, you hit this on before. It's, you grow your own deer on your own property. It, it, now it becomes a game and it's a fun game. You know, I got this buck. I got this buck. I got this buck. I got this buck. I, I'm you now this one's two and a half. This is three. Hey, listen, if that makes you happy and you like playing games with your deer, that's a lot of times, that's what a lot of guys hunt, you know? Right. So I think it's awesome. You know, you take your kids, please, everybody. Yes. Well, and I mean, that was, you know, we touched base on this before about how the hunting industry is, hunting industry is, it, it, it's it's a train wreck. I, I, I hate to say it. And I, I you know, I, I get ridiculed for it sometime, but I'm in this, I see it from my end and I see the public and I, I, I help the DNR and I work with different people and I'm starting to, you know, we, everybody's got different objectives. And some of their objectives are not what I call good objectives, mm -hmm. um, you know. And, and you know, in our future, our children would rather sit there and do this, 
and instead of going out and about. And But then again, I got customers that roll up with a whole pile of kids and they're loading stuff on the truck and they're all excited about they get to go out and do food plotting. And I think, oh my God, this is awesome. You know, you don't get this very often. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so there is the, you know, the, there's the good ones and, and then there's the ones that, you know, are what I call the weekend warriors who, well, I hope it works. Um, you know, you get all different types, you know, um, and you just, you're dealing with the public, which it is what it is, you know. Um, and, and, you know, again, it's about simplifying the whole process. If it's not scary, you can't mess it up. Right. So just have fun with it. Anybody, right. can, do it. Just have fun with it. Anybody can do it. And right. it's like a lot of things. Once you do it, you might find out, hey, that wasn't so bad. It doesn't matter. No, you know, and you don't need the big elaborate equipment either. No. You know, I mean, I got guys that come over here to pick up seeds sometimes, and they roll in with stuff, and I'm like, you're my hero. I get you know? it. Um, yeah. And, you know, that's all they have, but they're all doing it. And I'm like, God bless you. You know, I've seen from bed springs to you you name it. I've seen it all, you know, and I just. <laughs> That'll be know, the podcast, Doug. What's That'll that? Podcast. We'll do uh, we'll do something on. Uh, Don't care if you Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, you know, wouldn't there that be go. funny? There wouldn't that go. be funny? You know what? I'm telling you, because, you know, you don't need, you know, you don't need a $50,000 worth of equipment to put in a one-acre food plot. You know, it, you know, unless you got the money, God bless you, and knock yourself out. But in all reality, you know, everybody overthinks it, I think. Well, that goes know? back to the whole industry thing. You watch the Outdoor Channel, and what are the big names putting their food plots in with? So you automatically you think that's how you have to do it. And in reality, you next, you don't need, you know, you don't need hardly any equipment. You could do it with right. a backpack sprayer and a, a four wheeler, and sometimes even you know even less. So yes. it, yeah. if, if you're if you're willing to do it, that's more important than anything. I think I've got a disc from 1914. It's uh, she's an old one. Yeah, so, and, 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 hey, you know that's when it, that's when things were built well, right? Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Yes, I I get it. You know, but is there anything else you guys want to add? Well, I think is, are there any questions that you guys maybe had brought down that we maybe didn't cover or um the, the biggest yeah. the biggest thing, like I said, this segment was called Food Plot for Dummies. I'm sure we went over some people's head a little bit, but like I said, that's why you guys have you know, you guys have a company that people can obviously get a hold of you, ask mm-hmm. questions, things like that. And if anything else, that, that plot in a pale thing got me excited. I was like you know, because sometimes, like I said, you try to learn as much as you can, but some, thing, some things get lost in translation. Having a product like that, it's it's all right there. It's simplified. Like I said, that was that was a good move on your guys' part. Like that, that got me excited. So I, I mean, that's that's one of the comments that I have at least. I don't know about you, Doug, but you no, know, no, I, I everything you guys have been doing has been wonderful. I think uh, we get great feedback as a whole, um, pretty much from everybody. Um, you know, the quality of our products are, you know, second to none and, and as well as yours. So if you've got good quality products and you bring them together and you utilize them prop- properly, okay, yeah. you know, and, 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 the, and what I also explain to the customer, which, and you guys understand this as being, you know, all, you know, basically farmers, you know, mother nature always wins. Um, I don't care what you do unless you're going to, you know, water the plot or unless you're going to do this or do this or do this. You know, you're, you're at Mother Nature's mercy, you know, this last week with all this heat and people are like, I got a plant, I got a plant. And I'm like, just hang on to your underwear, man. You know, I, I you know, why, why I kill yourself? Little it's a li- little early, you know, don't get, don't get too excited. Uh, you know, uh, with this heat units, man, I live and you, you put something in the ground and it gets wet. It's going to be up in, you know, basically 72 hours for sure. Okay. So don't, don't, don't get too worried about it. Um, uh, you know, and then I got, uh, then I got my other customers that live, you know, in, in Missouri and Kentucky that planted in April, uh, stuff that should be planted in the fall. And then they're like, it's all flowering now. What do I do? And I'm like, Oh boy, you know, um, and you know, it's, you know, it's, it's all learning curves. I say, you know, um, and they learned what I say is the hard way. Um, you know, but it, no matter what we're growing as a company and use as well. And, and we're working together to feed off of each other and to feed our plants. And that's really what we're here for um, because healthy plants lead to healthy deer. And right. I, I, I over, I can never overemphasize that enough. So that's, that's what I try to relate to our customer. And I'm sure you guys do the same. Right. Just real quick, Doug, uh, you know, when you said Mother Nature always in, keep in mind guys that if you did go out and plant your plot and everything looks great, but then you get seven inches of rain in three and a half weeks, that fertility most likely is gone. 
Yep. So you might need to go out and and amend. So just keep yep. that a, not a one and done type of program. Mother Nature will throw curveballs, so just be be able to adjust it. You can, Last year I had to fertilize four times in one plot because we had 19 inches of rain. Yeah, yeah. So farmers do the same thing, right? You have to go with the conditions and what's what's dealt with it for that growing cycle. Yeah. No different in peat water. So you get what you put in it, you get out of it. And that's and, and that's a, a very very valid point, and that's my preaching to I say that all the time. So, but well, I think we did good. I brought, glad you guys. I know you guys got a busy day ahead of you, which I know I do. I don't have a life this time of year, um, but I appreciate you guys taking the time. This actually worked out good because now you don't have to worry about the rest of the week because you guys got bigger, bigger, and better plans. Um, and I know I'll be stuck in a warehouse and I'll not be thinking of you. Okay. So, all right, guys. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys having us coming on with us. Okay. Appreciate yeah. it, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.